you're tuned in to the Data Masters Podcast. In each episode, we dissect the complexities of data management and discuss the data strategies that fuel innovation, growth, and efficiency. We speak with industry leaders who share how their modern approaches to data management help their organizations succeed. Let's dive straight into today's episode with Anthony Dayton. So Nishit, welcome to Data Masters. I really appreciate you making the time. Um, I thought to start, uh, we might start a little bit with about Marvel technology. Uh, I'm not sure everybody is super familiar with Marvel and may not uh, have complete context and understanding for the business. So maybe just start, share a little bit about the company um, and sort of introduce people to Marvel technology. Sure, absolutely. And and it's a perfect timing because uh... You know, a couple of years ago, when I would say semiconductor, people would uh, give me blank stare back saying, what is semiconductor? And I used to have a joke that most people think we just make bad conductors. It's halfway. <laughs> so uh, what what we do is one of, we are one of the top semiconductor companies in the world. And in fact, if you look at anything uh, AI uh, lately, uh, some way or the other is powered by our technology. So, uh, but beyond that, we actually uh, make chips or semiconductor, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, devices for carriers. Uh, you know, a lot of 5G network has our components in it. Uh, uh, cars, uh, you know, we are, we are big in automotive world, but also what you call the enterprise market. So, uh, you know, if like I'm a CIO, I, I buy a lot of stuff, uh, you know, uh, switches and network uh, connectors and whatnot. And a lot of that has Marvel component in it. But the place where we are really differentiating lately is the data center. So we have the data center business, but within that, uh, we are a key player in the AI accelerated computing uh, space. So that's what Marvel does. On a day-to-day, you might not be seeing our brand when you use things, but be assured most of what you use has somewhere or the other Marvel technology uh, powering it. We have over 10,000 IP, so it's a very IP-centric, very engineering-focused company. And uh, in the semiconductor space, one of the most respected companies that's out there. So I think it's fair to say you make a very wide variety of products. uh, And as a result, almost certainly have fairly wide variety of customers. And, you know, in that sense, I think also it's not as though uh, listeners to the, the podcast would go out and buy Marvel products, but they almost certainly buy products that have your parts inside them and make them. Uh, better and sort of advanced versions of of the potential product. But how do you think about customer relationships in that context? In in that sense, um, how you think about the customer could be a bit different. Um, I imagine that you have a lot of customers and there's quite a lot of variety in those customers and the customer relationships you have with them. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to our customers, uh, it's a very close-knit relationship that you'd see with a company like Marvel. Now, if, uh, I mean, there are different types of products that we build, you rightly said. In some cases, we actually do custom products for the customer. That is, uh, you know, it's, uh, we're, we're collaborating with them to define this is how the product should be, and then we are building it all the way through. And again, in a deep collaboration with the customer. So it's a very, very high-touch relationship in those areas. And in some areas, uh, we have mass market. So we do it through distributors and all that because Marvel has great chips and everybody wants it. But if you really look at it uh, when, uh, at Marvel, uh, most of our customers are big customers. And uh, uh, you know, you're know, you talking about heavy infrastructure investment that they're doing in, whether it's uh, uh, all the markets that I talked about. Uh, so uh, when it comes to the relationship, our customers tend to be very knowledgeable about the product uh, because it's a, a B2B relationship. Um, and you see, that's what I see in, in, in the in the in the technology world. Marvel is a very uh, big brand name, but you see in a regular you know commercial world, uh, people might not be as aware unless until you're in Bay Area. Sure, and and I love that sort of idea that there's this really intimate relationship you have on your side, smart engineers that are really thinking about the underlying chipset, and they're working close collaboration with that customer to think about how that integrates uh, into the, uh, their product. Um, so let's tie this back to your data strategy. Um, so maybe start um, with just a little bit of a high-level context uh, to tell us a bit about the data strategy and 
and how it's changed and evolved over time? Because I know it's very different today than it was yeah. a year ago or five years ago. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. So the problem statements that we are dealing with somewhat is uh, determined by the industry we are in. Uh, also determine where we are geopolitically because, you know, uh, technology industry is very widespread. And then finally, that you mentioned the layering of customers and the products that we build in, right? So it's, it's a very complex supply chain that we have to deal with too. So I would say five, six years ago when we started to mature in our data strategy, it was very uh, metrics driven. You know, I would say very finance driven that, you know, we, we need to get our numbers right. And we need to have the right data fitting into our ecosystem so that we can get that more efficiently in front of business. Now, if you look at the history of the company, we scaled up pretty fast. We, we, we did some very strategic large size acquisitions. We brought in a lot of different flavors of technologies into our portfolio to make it more complete. And then we expanded uh, fairly uh, decently. So in those cases, a lot of data we needed were decision support data. Right, we need financial data. Need you know data around your customers. You need data around your uh, products, and uh, so we started with uh, a pure BI type strategy. So you have a request on the other end. We'll figure out where the data is, and then we'll uh, pipe it uh, through. And of course, we use that opportunity to also clean the sources. You know, because uh, again, uh, if you look at the journey we have been through, uh, Marvel has done a lot of work pretty much in all angles within the company. I mean, not outside, we're doing great stuff, but when you talk about technology foundations, we have been doing quite a bit of work on cleaning things up to scale, right? So we did a lot of work on the source uh, side as well. Uh, and those things are good incremental improvements uh, that we made. And, you know, like I said, the design support systems that we built were pretty useful when we did the scaling up through acquisitions. Now, a couple of years ago, we started to uh, drive uh, what people call data-driven transformations. So now we're looking at uh, larger data sets across the company that we had to bring together to make key decisions. So any decision, so Marvel is a very data-driven company, always been. And uh, you know, in, main, in most cases, there's some pull request from the other side saying, okay, I, I have to make a decision on a regular basis. And uh, Marvel ecosystem expects you to have the right data in front of people. Now that kind of slows me down in my decision-making because I can't present that data to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, to the stakeholders uh, on time. So we used to go uh, chase that kind of data, chase the kind of decision uh, uh, driving factors that people have and then go all the way backwards. But then we started to look at the whole ecosystem we have and how you know individually all of them are working versus how they're working together. You know, something like an integrated business planning. So we started to stage data, not just based on requirement, but based on the business process, end-to-end -end business process. And there you build the ecosystem where you can ask any question. And it's not like a six months project every time you have a requirement to get the data through. So that is, I would say, um, stage two, right? Stage three, uh, which we are in, is a little bit more complicated. Now we are getting outside the realm of your structured data, things normally which are clean in a company if you do your upstream process, right? Now we're getting into uh, a wide variety of data because you want to bring engineering knowledge to our uh, uh, systems. So with that, now we're looking into data governance, uh, you know, more advanced data pipeline, all the key, uh, you know, uh, uh, latest and greatest that you can think about data mesh or uh, data house, uh, lake houses. So uh, now this is some a journey that we are on and a lot of that is going to be just, you know, your basic decision-making process, but a lot of it is actually going to be feeding into our AI pipeline that you're building very aggressively in the company. Yeah, so not to go too far backwards in that story, but where you started, I think, is probably where a lot of companies are uh, today, and they're thinking about what are the key metrics that matter, and then building this, um, I, I, you called it a request-based uh, idea that people make the request. I call it sort of hunt and peck. Uh, you know, people make a request, somebody has to form a data set to re respond to that. It gets placed in front of them, you know, hopefully reasonably quickly, but probably measured in days and weeks uh, in a dashboard. Um, and, and I think that's a very common place where, where sorry, listeners are uh, today. Um, I do love this idea that you focused on 
uh, remediating sources and getting sources to be uh, in better, you know, in a better, uh, in better shape. Um, how did you, you know, how did that go? Like uh, my general experience has been that uh, trying to get source data to be perfect is, um, you know, uh, you know, can feel like a fusel exercise. Like you're, you're, as soon as you get it a little bit better, then, you know, somebody makes a change or a new source gets added. How did you guys think about that? No, that's, that's an excellent point. And in fact, one of our learning was sometimes it's okay to leave the source the way it is because the return on cleaning that up is probably not very good. Now, the way we, uh, again, in, in terms of maturity, right, initial set of source cleaning that we are doing, it was also essential for the company. Like you have to have your ERP processes done well, your supply chain processes done well, your CRM processes done well. I mean, that's mandatory for a company to be efficient, right? So there it made sense for us to go to the source and clean it up. Uh, this requires a big, uh, you know, cultural, uh, I would say, uh, support from the company. So if your company has a culture of collaboration, if your company understands the value of data, the value of clean, and pro uh, clean processes, then it's much easier to drive. So for us, a lot of our job was much easier because Marvel does have that culture. And there we had an alignment saying, okay, you know, uh, sometimes uh, uh, you have a process which is not the cleanest process in the world, but it does the job. So in, th in those cases, just have a good control process around it. So you know that if this is happening, uh, you know, uh, uh, at least your data set that's coming out is the right data set, because ultimately you're making decisions based on that data. In some cases, we automated the system to, to, to make it fully foolproof and robust. Now, Good thing there was we uh, we had enough time early on because if you look at six, seven years ago, things were not so dynamic, right? I mean, they're moving at a certain pace. Our uh, path was pretty much defined by us. So if Marvel wanted to move at a particular pace, we move at a particular pace. I wish Marvel moved very fast. So that's why we moved fast on the data cleaning side too. Then comes 2019-ish timeframe where it looks like everything became, uh, you know, everything was thrown up in the air and anything is a variable that you can think of, right? Geopolitical situations got in, uh, pandemic got in, you know, technology uh, world was upside down with the supply chain crisis. And then there's a huge unprecedented demand that you saw in uh, Silicon space, then you a huge unprecedented drop of demand that you saw in Silicon space. And then the AI came in. So, uh, now the question here is with that kind of dynamics that you have uh, surrounding you, where do you invest and what do you prioritize? So that is the piece again. So the, we are still very outcome driven. So, you know, while I talked about looking at the entire end-to-end -end business process, but that is for an outcome that we are trying to drive. So for example, for us, we want to have a very efficient supply chain. We have want to provide a very good customer service and, uh, you know, drive our top line and bottom line uh, to the perfect point. So it's, that's an outcome. And then you're looking at the end-to-end -end business process, and then you're looking at the end-to-end -end data models and trying to put that in place. So that is, uh, you know, uh, that's a journey which will change as and when the company's strategy change, which at a macro level, it doesn't change that often, uh, versus the one earlier that I talked about, uh, you know, uh, it, it was, it was, it was uh, pretty much, um, uh, you know, you had more time in hand because your, your things didn't change that frequently. So uh, what I hear you saying is that the, one of the big drivers of your data strategy is your business strategy. So yes. as you say, things sped up, we had a global pandemic, uh, and all of a sudden being agile with data became uh, really important, became important because it was driven by your business strategy and this outside reality that affects the business. Um, I also know that you are, and, and you said this, fundamentally an engineering-driven company, uh, a company that builds engineering products for engineering people by engineers. Uh, I also imagine that that internal dynamic of who your customer, your user, your internal data users are almost certainly affected your data strategy. Fair or? Uh, that is true. Uh, so I think initial part uh, of our work was uh, more on non-engineering aspect of the work, yeah. you know, the company. Like I said, the supply chains, SGNA functions. Because apart from being an engineering-focused company, we're also a growth company, right? So it's a company which is going to scale, scale into new markets, scale into new set of customers, and really go up in the volume. 
So a lot of work was in that area. So even though we are an engineering focused company, we are a business that we have to run very efficiently. And if you look at the problem statements that Marvel has been facing while we are doing great work in terms of the technology that we are in, the nodes that we are advancing ourselves in, we rely a lot on our ecosystem, our supplier ecosystem. Uh, so we are a fabulous company. So it is very critical for us to have a very strong partnership around us. And it's a global partnership. Most of the manufacturing is uh, you know, not located in one particular zone. It's very uh, spread out. We also do specialized parts. So it's not like uh, even though you know, we have the usual list of suppliers that you would hear, more semiconductor companies have. We also have some uh, specialized ones, especially in our modules area. Now you're talking about very complex supply chain. So, uh, and, and you talked about all these factors that actually touch us the supply chain, uh, global factors, India, US, China relationship, or you, know, you can name it. <laughs> uh, and, and for us, we have to make quick decisions around that and have a good visibility. So actually before the decision side of it, you have to understand what's going on so that you can decide certain things, right? And going back to your initial point, uh, yeah, I mean, initially, or a lot of companies right now, what they do is somebody says, I want this report, I want this data, I want it to be presented in this format. And one of the common problem statements people face is when the information is in front of them, they change their requirement, right? A typical IT grief, uh, you had a business requirements document, you completely changed it as soon as they deployed the report. But there's a legitimate reason. You don't know what you want till you see the data. So that is the approach that we're now taking is let's get the data in front of people in the right business process to align with their business strategy. And then we'll figure out how they want to visualize it, how they see it, how they want to slice and dice it. Yeah, so sort of getting agreement on those core data sets that matter, ones connected to the, the business challenges, and then thinking about uh, that analytically. Now, you mentioned uh, stage three where you're uh, investing today. Um, you mentioned uh, how you're thinking about things like unstructured data, providing structure for data that might not have traditionally entered into your analysis historically. Now you're bringing that kind of data in. I imagine you're also thinking about tagging and quality, yes. uh, classification of data. But share a little bit about you know where you find yourself today and sort of how it goes from here. Yeah. No, actually, uh, that is... Uh a mountain of a problem statement that we have realized that we had to solve. So Marvel sits on a lot of data, right? Even though we are not a B2C company, B2C company has a lot of, uh, you know, uh, tends to have a lot more data than we do. But we have a lot of technology data that's sitting in front of us. Now, for companies like us, again, uh, if we have to really take advantage of the AI revolution, uh, the real meat is when we bring our context, our knowledge into it. Now, the question is, how do we bring it? So, and that's where the data, unstructured data part of it came into the being. So it's not so much about reporting, but also it is, it's, it's, it's more to do uh, to feed in this AI pipelines that we are uh, developing. Now, uh, coming up with the, where we are with it, we are in a, uh, you know, what should we do mode? Because when you start to drill down into this problem statement, you're looking at it from various different angles, right? Well, companies like us are very good at external security. This is an example. Uh, we do excellent source system security, but as soon as you move the data across, you know how would you track if you're doing things right? So that's one example on security angle. But now if you compound that with the compliance need that most of the geographies that we actually operate in, whether it's US, uh, you know, Europe, and uh, lately in India and Vietnam and China, and China of course has been very popular in that area in terms of their strict requirements and compliance. When you bring this content in and feed an AI pipeline of a sudden your data protection, your uh, you know, data compliance requirements just becomes multifold, right? Now, what we are doing is we are trying to understand what we have. So there are two things. One is like we are building these AI pipelines, we are building these AI systems, and as then we feed them, we actually look at the data and make sure that everything is clean. But now we realize if you had to scale it up, you know, right now, most companies are in a build state, right? You're piloting things for 100 users, 200 users. You're curating data for those uh, engines. But if you want to scale up, if you want to feed in large amount of data for these AI systems to really move the needle, you have to look at data foundations. 
So think about, right? Most company have data all over the company. Most companies don't think about uh, data quality when they're feeding in data because it didn't matter to them, right? It, if you're writing a technical spec, let's take that as an example. Uh, everybody knows this is the final version of the technical spec, which has to be used by developer and the product is built. And who cares about the technical spec <laughs> till, till uh, a revision is required? Now, uh, you might have 100 versions of the technical spec. And one is the one that you really want to use to feed in your pipeline. Which one? So you have the redundancy issue that I just brought in. In the data itself or in the spec itself, you might uh, start putting in people's information, like you know, a requirement coming from XYZ. And all of a sudden, you have a personal information in the spec that you never thought of. It's not, a, uh, again, in this example, it's not, a, it's not a HR data. You're talking about a technical data. And then you might have some customer information embedded in it, right? Because you have a customer requirement coming off of a sudden, you have customer's data in it, all unstructured, all in this format, looking at the tag or uh, the metadata of the document, you can figure out that this problem actually exists. And then you're starting to feed it into these uh, uh, knowledge graphs where uh, you know, you're pretty much everything just comes together in a vector format. And now you try to figure out controls on top of it. Now that's, that's very difficult. So for us, understanding our data understanding the ownership, understanding the redundancy of it, and trying to figure out uh, at domain level, how do we control the quality? How do we control the compliance? Uh, how do we tag the data? How do we classify the data? That is the problem statement that we have started to work on. We are building teams around it. And the first thing you have to do is you have to hire a data officer, which is what we did. <laughs> so uh, now we're building teams around it. We are uh, working with the security team, working with the um, uh, compliance team, and more importantly, working with the domains, right? I mean, the B business units and the functional leads to, uh, to, 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 to have a program structure in place. And then uh, it, it will prioritize certain things too. So that those things are coming, but um, this is where we are. We have, uh, I would say we have recognized the problem statement. <laughs> yeah, so I, I mean, I, and I think there's a, a couple of important lessons there. Um, the first is, uh, this idea of managing data by domains, as you call it, we often call them entities, but you know, we call them entity domains. Uh, but, and this is a really important idea, uh, rather than trying to think about governing and managing source systems, and there's nothing, as you point out, it's important to look at source quality and, and manage that. You're thinking about managing the outcome, the resultant data. Um, and then the second thing, if I can uh, pull it out of what you said, is it's not considered a data task or an IT task, but it's considered a whole company task. And you've really brought uh, everybody together to say, for this type of data, you know, who cares about it? And who's gonna take control and ownership over it? And who's gonna manage its quality and tagging to use those examples or whatever the, the issues. And what I find particularly interesting <clears throat> in what you talk about is that for, for you, uh, AI is a driver for that. Um, and this goes to something that we've been uh, talking a lot about, um, that we talk about the thing that's missing in enterprise data today are nouns. So what I mean by that, um, you use the example that you write up a product spec and in there is a company's name or a person's name. Uh, having a system that can know that that thing is a company, that's a, that was rather that company is a customer or that that name is a person who works at Marvel, uh, you know, and uh, has that definition of that noun or that entity to use, uh, or domain, whatever word we want to use, um, that's pretty unusual. And that's not something you see in consumer AI, right? Because, you know, we have common understandings of nouns in the consumer world, but in enterprise, uh, it's really important because, you know, these things have real meaning. Is, is that fair? No, that is, that is true. And I would say to a certain extent for enterprise type companies, the awareness has not been there, right? So in B2C companies, I would say in these matters, they were a little bit more mature. They realize they're actually intentionally having the nouns in their content. Uh, for us, uh, again, it's, it's an old company, right? We've been here for almost 30 years. Uh, this kind of uh, sensitivity or maturity has grown over a period of time. So we're talking about a lot of content, a lot of nouns in it. Uh, using your term, it's a good term. I'm gonna actually gonna steal it. 
So, uh, and then understanding the impact of it, uh, that's, that's, that's huge. Yeah. So it's clear, uh, AI is a big driver in Marvel's business, uh, overall and their strategy and roadmap. Um, how, how are you, you know, how are you seeing it affect, or, or maybe say, do you see it affect the way people have expectations about, uh, the data team and, and how how data is delivered inside the enterprise. Um, you know, are, 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 are we going to replace everybody with a chat interface? How are you guys, <laughs> how are you thinking about that? Well, uh, uh, I don't see that even replacing a single person, quite frankly. I mean, if uh, my, and some of it is, uh, uh, it's going to be an opinion, right? So, sure, sure. uh, none of such technologies ever replaced people. It changed the way they function for sure. And it's just going to scale up. There are certain things we just never did. We didn't, de uh, we, we didn't do it at, a, uh, at the right pace, right? Uh, and that's what is going to change. Because these technologies, at least where they are, they're not autonomous in nature. And if any company is trying to make uh, it uh, autonomous, uh, I feel they're on a very wrong path. Because A, uh, for a couple of reasons. First is, you start to do that. If, if your technology is going to be replacing your employees, then you won't have those employees help you build the technology. And until they are in the loop, this is not going to work. Uh, that's the first thing. First thing is the feasibility of the deployment itself if their strategy is replacing people. The second thing is uh, none of where we are. We, we talk about high accuracy percentage of 90%, right? I mean, that's a huge accuracy in AI world. Well, you still have 10% wrong. <laughs> so you need to have human in loop. And the third thing is, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not the technology itself, but it's a mix of how your business process, your, uh, you know, your people and this data support ecosystem comes along with the technology, which makes a business transformation happen. So we are looking at transformation here. When you talk about replacing headcounts, when you talk about organizational efficiency, these are incremental process, right? In the IT world, we've been automating things to do that uh, ever since I've started working in IT. But this is something different. This is something about doing more, doing it better. And that's the approach, at least what we have taken, is not talk about employee, you know, headcount reduction, but look at how we can actually accelerate certain things. How, we, how can we accelerate product development? How can we make our decision uh, process faster? So that's the approach we have taken, and we took it very consciously. Uh, you know, given that uh, where it, this technology is and what we need to make it more successful. Yeah, so I think the the thing that I think a lot about here is um, this shift from the impossible to the possible. Um, one of the things you see in disruptive technologies in general is this, um, it's, it's not about making something incrementally better. It's about something that was previously impossible now becoming something that we can do something that's possible. And I think this is particularly true in the data context. Um, and to say this in a funny way, if you roll back the clock, uh, you know, in any data organization, why haven't we cleaned up all of our enterprise data? Why is it that, that that's still a mess? And it's because it's, as you point out, it's fundamentally a scale problem. You cannot hire enough people to clean all the data, to you know, have it all be perfect, and then make sure no one ever changes anything or adds a new system or it doesn't act as a God forbid something changes. Uh, and that's obviously not realistic. Right. So I think very much to your point, AI is about scaling things that previously were not possible to scale, do them in a cost-effective way. Um, so, um, Shifting gears slightly, uh, you, you've obviously been extremely successful uh, in your career. You've moved up uh, both uh, at Marvel and at Analog before that. Um, I just give you the opportunity. What lessons have you learned uh, along the way that could be useful to, to listeners? Uh, secret recipes. <laughs> yeah. It's not so secret, actually. Most of it is very obvious. And, uh, you know, so first thing I would say what helped me the most in my career, I always ask for help. So if I'm stuck somewhere, uh, you know, uh, normally I would just look around people who can come in and you can jump in and help. 
And so it's actually amazing how people actually love doing that. They actually prefer doing that. So, uh, uh, and, and I've worked in companies with various cultures, right? And Marvel is known for its amazing culture and collaborative environment. And Maxim before that is a good, a good company. But when I was working for SAP, I had worked with a lot of customers too. And, you know, not everybody had the best culture in the world. But then still, when you ask for help, when you ask them to participate in problem solving, it's a human tendency uh, to do that. And that has always helped me. So uh, normally what I do is I'll pick up a function which is uh, hard to deliver. And then I look for all those people who can come around and help me do it and build a team which can actually work together and solving that problem. And then that normally results to a, a good success. And when you have these success lined up and everybody is rooting for your success, then normally you are successful, right? So that has helped me. And every time I try to, uh, you know, some cases, you know, you want to be a lone wolf and do things because you think you're really fast. And I fell on my face right away and corrected course and just got back to the thing that always worked. So, uh, you know, taking right help at the right time, collaborating with the ecosystem or with the stakeholders, with uh, my uh, technology partners, with vendors, some cases with the customers to, uh, to make a goal successful, that has always helped me. Yeah, there's a, a certain sense of humility that's important there because to ask for help is also to uh, acknowledge that you don't know uh, everything. And that's certainly not a common attribute in executives for, for what it's worth. I, I often see uh, the opposite behavior in executives as I know, I know best, I know all type behavior. So I do think that's actually a, a really important lesson. Sorry, I, you were saying. No, no, that's, uh, and by the way, you do have to fight your uh, human nature to ask for help. Uh, I'm one of those people who would be losing, you know, when driving, will have no idea where I am before the GPS will come in and but would never stop to ask somebody. <laughs> so it was also work on my end to realize, okay, this is the right thing to do. Uh, because you're, you're, you know, you, you're uh, working towards a larger goal than yourself. Uh, so let's say, if, you know, the company is driving big uh, business transformation or system transformation or big acquisition. That's, uh, it's not about you, right? It's about a larger goal than you. So that is a time, perfect time to go ask for help. And people like to work on those things. And that goes into the collaboration side of it, right? And, and of course, when you're asking for help, when people are helping, uh, the reverse has to be true too. When they ask for help, you should be ready for uh, doing that. You can't be saying that too busy, uh, come another day, right? So you have to be, uh, you have to give back some too. Uh, the second bit I would say is uh, collaboration. But collaboration is, again, a very overused term. I would say a communication along with a collaboration, right? So you can talk horizontally. People normally talk, well, vertically, uh, whether to their team uh, or to their management. When I say normally, you know, uh, the ones at least on the executive layer. But I feel the horizontal communication is not always perfect. And that is something I work towards, and that requires us to, you know, sit with the person, understand what they do, empathize with their work, uh, in that process, also gain some knowledge in the area so you can talk in the common terms. Uh, and that has been uh, fairly helpful in my career growth. And I think that's, a, that's always a challenging one because, uh, as you say, vertically, there are uh, strong incentive structures in place right. for those communication to be effective. Uh, when you're working across an organization, it's, it's, it's about convincing, conjoling, you know, bringing people along, explaining why it's in their interests to contribute and that sort of thing, um, which is, you know, naturally harder. Uh, and they're not, may not be the natural incentives that are in place in a boss subordinate type hierarchy, if that makes sense. Uh, no, I think that those are both, uh, uh, excellent, uh, excellent pieces of advice. And, uh, uh, I think we are, uh, at time. So Nisha, I really appreciate you joining us on Data Masters and sharing your thoughts on uh, Marvel and your data journey and what you're working on and successes. Uh, and I wish you uh, only the best. Awesome. Great talking to you. Thanks for joining us for the latest episode of the Data Masters podcast. You'll find links in the show notes to any resources mentioned on today's show. And if you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe so you never miss an episode. Experience Tamer's proven data-centric AI. 
engineered to speed the discovery, enrichment, and maintenance of the Golden Records businesses need to accelerate growth. Tamer's expertise in quickly and accurately unifying large amounts of data across disparate sources gets results faster at a lower cost compared to traditional master data management or DIY solutions. Stop wasting time on bad data. Visit www.tamer.com, that's T-A-M-R.com, to see results now.